Hello, guys. Good evening. Uh, this is uh, Vedant Mishra. I would be your host today. A welcome for our uh, webinar today. That is short selling in current markets with Lauren Bernard. I'm giving a little bit of background uh, to of uh, Lauren. I believe uh, you can see that he has been having an experience of 18 years in alternative investment space, mostly on the fid uh, fidelity investments of almost. Uh, eight years and he has worked as a dedicated short seller in one of the longest bear markets in modern history and as we all know it's uh, japanese equities lawland's research to generate alpha in the alternative space has been built basically in the expertise of uh, systematic trading process so lauren if you can just uh, give a gist about uh, your background before we start uh, i think uh, that would be great Oh, sure. Uh, thank you very much. So my name is Laurent Bernou. I'm from, uh, I was born in New Zealand, uh, grew up in New Caledonia, so I'm French and Kiwi. Um, originally, I'm, uh, I studied economics and uh, I'm a US CPA. So I started, I did, I used to compile financial statements for Japanese companies, for listed financial companies, the Yuka Shoken, Hokoku Sho, Kesan Tanshin, and all these things, transfer pricing, for a listed company it was uh, pre Enron. And when Enron and Welcome happened, as in every bear market, people realized, wait a minute, wait a minute, companies don't, they have something else than EPS, earnings per share. They have this, uh, this thing called balance sheet, really? And then they have this thing called cash flow? No way. So people rediscovered that and discovered that Japanese accounting principles are a bit different. So this is how I made my first foray into the market. I came on the sell side. And in 2002, 2003, early, late 2002, early 2003, I was canned. I was literally canned out of classic, classic brokerage. Uh, I was canned two, three weeks before the, the bottom of the bear market. So, you know, like whenever you're fired from, uh, from your job in finance, first of, first of all, you've not worked in finance until you've been fired three times. So don't tell me you've been working in finance unless you've been fired at least twice. <laughs> you've just been apprenticing. <laughs> That's so, right. So in true fashion, I got fired literally uh, three weeks before the bottom of the bear market. And the second uh, second uh, thing about this is whenever you get fired, just drop your severance package on the first ETF you can find because the bear, the bull market is around the corner. And sure enough, market turnaround and I joined a startup hedge fund and over there I developed portfolio management system uh, so my belief about and there's, there, I really 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 got to it like this is really important a lot of hedge funds they they basically believe that it's about picking stocks and so on and so forth this hedge fund was very different in a sense that they believe that risk management is not part of the business it's not it's not a marketing brochure it is the business it's like you can fly without instruments when everything's fine, but good luck landing in Hong Kong, good luck landing in Bhutan, and good luck landing when there's fog at night. So you need instruments to fly your hedge funds, otherwise you will crash. Something that a lot of people have learned again the very hard way in March this year. So I did that for a few years, then I joined another hedge fund. And uh, over there, I developed a keen interest in short selling. I was compiling a database of monthly numbers and I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute, like this stock is going up, the monthly numbers are going down, something's gonna give, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> so then in 2007, I decided, to, I mean, at that time, every, like every other English teacher in Tokyo, you're an English teacher? Well, so you can do stories, right? Okay, you're a fundamental analyst. You, you're crawling under the desk, you're, you're fixing up the spaghetti, you can you can actually configure a computer. Wow, you do a lot of IT things, you can install Windows, all right, you're a quant. So it was getting really too easy. And I thought, okay, this is really too easy. And I decided to dock in somewhere safe and with smart people and I joined Fidelity on the alternative side. So I was a systematic quantitative short seller in a bottom-up fundamental traditional long only house. So it's like oil and water trying to mix together. And over there I survived the uh, ATS and I thrived and I had had a blast very very intelligent people. But one thing for sure, and then my mandate was to uh, as a short seller, a dedicated short seller, was to underperform the worst bear market on his on record. 
So I was a quantitative. Oh, is it? Yeah, 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 like 20 years bear market. So I was like quantitative, systematic, and bottom-up fundamental long only. And I and I was trying to doing the uh, I, my job was trying to perform the the worst bear market on record. So every day I woke up net short minus 100 percent, and I had to do worse than that. So when the nuclear apocalypse shows up, I hope I just hope I can land on some Bordeaux and some Bourgogne, because speaking to cockroaches, scorpions, and ants is gonna be very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I can survive pretty much anything. That's basically bottom line. So after that, uh, yeah. <laughs> in 2015, I decided to um, to launch on a on a journey of uh, systematic uh, in investing. I decided to like my time doing this was done, and I th and I decided to launch a company. Unfortunately, it didn't go very well. Uh, didn't go. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are stories. And now uh, this year. Very short, very soon. I'm starting a, a project with not only one but several people. So the one that is very interesting is with somebody we'll talk about later, Ram Arusi. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do hedge fund in a box. And also, I've had the privilege and the honor of uh, working with Quant Institute. Fabulous people, remarkable people, and it's been an honor and a privilege. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, so Lauren. Really appreciate you as well. And thank you so much for taking our time. It's, uh, I believe, it's almost nine uh, in, the, in the night at your end, right? Correct. It's, uh, uh, it is uh, nine twenty-five. So, so that's that, that's speak. really appreciated. This shows your effort and uh, you know the extent that you can go when it comes to capital markets, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, this is a passion. My belief and my mission, my my wish is to help people make better. I, I believe that if 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 investment is uh, if investment is an, is a process, then automation is the next logical conclusion. Speaking of which, uh, this is the thing that we're developing with uh, Rana Rusi. We'll talk about that. Like, we'll briefly touch upon it. Uh, very very briefly. Uh, if if somebody is interested, if a question comes about, we'll talk about it. Otherwise, we probably won't mention it. But there's something that is that could help people who use Blue Shift to actually convert their code to uh, for the API. But we'll talk about it if people are interested. If nobody's interested, we won't talk about it. Right. So and we'll talk we'll we'll talk about an aspect of that later in the presentation because I believe it's important for everyone. So anyhow, uh, so this is what we do. And uh, today, what I would like to do is, uh, back in March, the, the market imploded, and uh, for the longest period of time, people have been bull like, basically, short selling is like a muscle. If you don't exercise, it atrophies. And for me, I've, it's not my first bear market. It's actually my fourth. Not only that, but I woke up every day, net short, minus 100%. You, I woke up different, I am different, I think different. And being a short seller is not like the inverse of being long. This is a different mental process. This is a different statistical process. This is a different process altogether. And here's why it is important for anyone who wants to live in the alternative uh, world to learn short selling. Perfect, Lauren. Is, so uh, what I'll do is, uh, you know, I think uh, it's over to you, Lauren. You know, you, you can share your screen and... Uh, we can proceed okay. ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much, Vedant. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. You. Really appreciate it. So I would be, uh, uh, so don't worry, guys. Uh, I won't be logging out. I would be there uh, to help with any questions that you guys might have. And we would be getting in touch with the questions, Q&A session uh, post and very quickly. Thanks, Laurel. Over to you. Thank you very much for that. So now what you can see is a, is a fabulous app that I truly recommend. It's called Corculus. You know, like you, uh, back in the days when it's uh, when the World Wide Web used to be uh, uh, used to be this thing, uh, uh, when there used to be Netscape, people had cork boards where they used to pin stuff. This is the digital version of it. This is on, on uh, the something on which I do most of my creative work. So today we'll talk about, I mean, very broadly, uh, we'll talk about why it's important for you to learn short selling. 
in very broad strokes. Second thing is we'll talk about a methodology that will help you navigate the markets calmly. Then we'll go back to the source code. Most unfortunately, you had some technical trouble throughout the week, so it'll be a bit patchy. I'll de uh, instead of delivering like thousands and lines of code, I will deliver a very clean file for all, for the attendees. And uh, we'll talk about the methodology. We'll talk about uh, why there's floor and ceiling, what it does. We'll talk also about the anatomy of a bear market. Like there's been a disconnect between markets rallying and economies imploding. So we'll talk about this and we'll understand why. Then we'll see whether if this time it's really different and what up and how to navigate the market calmly thereafter. So why, first, first of all, why is it important for you to learn short selling? Well, if, you, if you're a quantitative person, which obviously you are because you're here, uh, first of all, like doing the traditional long only and all this, this is something that you have to outperform the, the market, which means that basically this is something that ETFs do better than usual, than traditional fund managers. That's number one. So it's a matter of evolution. And as we know, as Darwin says, evolution does not take prisoners. Now, if you think that you're on the hedge fund side, you're a stock picker and so on and so forth, what happens is, as a stock picker on the long side, you're competing with a mutual fund, which competes with an ETF. We know that a mutual fund, for a fraction of the price, you get a mutual fund, and for a fraction of the mutual fund, you get an ETF. So this is a matter of evolution. Either you graduate to something better, either you evolve, either somebody else will, and it's a highly competitive world. Now, why is the short side key to raising a UM? It's very, very simple. Look at what happened in April, March and April. Very few hedge funds stood up. Those who stand up, who still stood up, stand up. It's not very rocket science. Guys like Paulson, I mean, uh, guys like Ackman, their funds ring off the hook. I mean, for me, it's been a very healthy year. Thank you very much, but I don't want to, <laughs> maybe we can talk about it later if you're so interested. But uh, it's been a very healthy year. Uh, a bumpy one, but a healthy one. So the idea there is if you can sell short, you will have a job and you will attract investors. Not only that, you will retain your investors. The hedge fund is a very healthy fee structure. And people can cough up expensive commissions as long as there's downside protection. And as we saw in uh, April, when the tide recedes, there was a lot of junk and indecent exposure. So now let's move on to something else, the, the floor and ceiling method. So, you know, I, ideally what we want to do is we want to buy the outperformers and we want to sell the underperformers. So far, so good. That's, this is what everybody wants to do. So we want in any index, like whether it's the S&P, whether it's um, topics, whatever you name it, you want to buy the outperformers, uh, sell the underperformers, make money on the delta. So this is what it looks like. And this is a method that I've developed, and this is a method that actually pretty much, I'm pretty sure that everybody instinctively does. Come on, all right, here we go. So here we go. So far, is there any question? If there are questions, please raise your hand. If they don't, please let me know. Uh, sure, I think uh, there is one question from Andres Bagnasco that when shorting a stock or index in terms of liquidity, what do you care most? Shortable shares, utilization metric? That's the question for you. Oh, fantastic. All right. That's a question I would love to answer later. Uh, first of all, you're talking about liquidity. So, okay, short selling, uh, the way to think about liquidity in the short, as a short seller is very different from the liquidity as a long only. As a long only, you buy stuff when it's low, when nobody wants it, and I mean, hopefully, and then you write it up, right? So basically, you have incremental, accretive incremental liquidity. On the short side, it's a one-way street. You're basically writing the tale of people who sell their stock. So you are writing decreasing liquidity. So when you size your position, you don't size your position expecting them to grow, but expecting them to shrink, and you expect less and less liquidity. That's a very important component. 
So very often what happens is that people take huge positions because they have this thing called conviction. Leave it to Madoff. I mean, this guy's a lot of conviction, a lifelong worth of conviction. So leave it to Madoff. Um, but Bernie Madoff is good with that. But on the other hand, what you want to do is you want to size your position small enough so that you can actually liquidate them, get out of the position without having market impact. So that's one thing. Now you're talking about valuations and fundamentals. This is uh, this is something that we'll see later. For now, we're going to look at market regime. So the idea there is something that everybody does. So the the world the word triage, like buy the outperformer, sell the underperformer, is basically an index, whether it's the S&P, FTSE, whatever, is uh, generally except for Nikkei, which is a uh, which is a price weighted. They're all market cap weighted which means that it's a weighted average of all the market caps, which means that basically roughly 50% of the stocks will outperform the markets, 50% of them will end up perform the market. Now the question is how do you find a stable, uh, relatively accurate and robust way to segregate the market between the outperformers and underperformers without sacrificing too much time into it? So this is something that Absolutely, everybody has done. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but here you have something called a floor. So market prints a low, and market, it's a, this is a floor, market prints a swing high, and then market prints a swing low. From that swing low, they don't have to be consecutive. You measure the distance to the floor. So if it has rallied up quite significantly, probably this thing is going to continue to rally up. Conversely, it prints a ceiling, market tanks, it rallies, but it doesn't take the previous high. It's just, ah, ah, no thanks. And then it and then goes down, boom. So probably this thing is gonna to continue to go down. This is something that intuitively, instinctively, everybody has done since the dawn of time. The classic definition of a bear market, market which is by 20%, and then it turns into a bull market once it takes out the new high. If we'd gone with that definition, the market that we had in the US would have been bull since 2017 instead of 2019. Only in 2017 did it take the previous high. Now, as far as I know, a lot of commentators were very happy about the bull right from 2009, March 2009, all the way up to 2017. So the classic definition doesn't work. On the other hand, what's something that everybody does instinctively? I didn't invent, uh, like, a, I'm very happy I, invent, I invented lukewarm water. <laughs> I just managed to quantify it. So the idea there is we find a low, lowest low, and then we measure versus subsequent lows. If the distance is high enough, 1.5 standard deviation. Why 1.5 standard deviation? Is because assuming a normal distribution, normally uh, distributed returns, it gives a cumulative distribution of uh, 80%. Might work, might not work, but it's fairly simple. Now, there are two ways to measure a regime. One is the classic definition I just mentioned, which is swing low versus the floor. And the other one is when it breaks down. When the market tanks below, then, oh, you thought it, you would be in bull market, but the market has just decided something else. It just penetrate the floor or penetrate the discovery swing high, as we'll see later. In which case, Discovering swing lows we see later. Um, in which case, the market has reverted back to the dominant trend. So in this case, the market has turned bearish. Now, yours truly, I'll give you a true story. And actually, I'll talk, I'll, I'll talk about that later. It's more interesting to talk about that later. So, so, Naresh, case, has, uh, so uh, Naresh has one question that this would be a great state to short if you don't hold at all, correct? Uh, yes. Actually, that uh, ETF, IGF, I'm short. Uh, stock and have a story about it. You want to hear that story? It is comical. Um, it, yes, it's a great story. Let's talk to short. Was it the question? Did I answer the question? Yeah, um, kind of. Basically, uh, he, he was asking about uh, the the great state, the particular state that he mentioned that would be uh, that this would be a great state to short if you don't hold at all. Is this correct? Is this what? No. In, He's asking. Uh, the answer is yes and no, and this is the reason why we do we're having this uh, webinar now. <laughs> and to be frank, today, today, I mean, today, I would have loved to walk to walk. Now, this is like serendipitous, and there'll be a, there'll be a record for that. 
today uh, we've had a flurry of short selling signal. Today I will reverse some position that I had long and I will turn into shorts. And we were talking about that with a friend of mine, like a city uh, trader, but we'll talk about that. So is this for day trading you're saying about? Is this for day trading or any positional? Uh, no, this is that. Oh, okay. This this floor and ceiling works. This is a, something that we'll see right now. This works on anything, and a, this works on absolute and relative. Let me show you what it mean, what I mean by this. Using the floor and ceiling method on absolute, this is S M P. You can see that the S M P has gone up, and the green line stands for a lateral count of the stuff that is in bull regime. The red line is the stuff that is in bear regime. So as you can see, market goes up and there's a balloon, like the market goes up, tons and tons and tons of stuff to go long. All right. Now, and this is an important point. Same story, but what we have now, instead of having the floor and ceiling on absolute as we saw before, we have it on relative. So what we do is we have like open, high, low, close divided by the close of the index, which gives a relative series. So what happens when we do that? When we divide by the index, we basically split, we take away the market effect. So we take, we only measure the excess return over the benchmark because by dividing by the index, by definition, we strip the, uh, the return of the market. So what you can see now is the green line and the red line, they're fairly close together. So you roughly have the same number of our performers and the same number of vendor performers. Now, because I'm a short seller, I didn't care. About, like people are gonna probably gonna talk about, yeah, well, but in this you have uh, what's that? Uh, what what bias are we talking about? I forgot it. Survivorship bias. I'm a short seller. I'm a short seller. So survivorship bias definitely doesn't concern me. Like the survivorship bias is basically a lot of stocks are removed from the index when they start underperforming. So that the index has na a natural upward drift. So whatever like stocks that go bankrupt, they get removed. Stocks that get too small, they get removed. Stocks that grow and get bigger, they get they, this inclusion deletion. In the case of a short seller, survivorship bias is irrelevant. By definition, being a seller, it's irrelevant. So what you see here, even with the survivorship bias, is that actually you have roughly the same number of longs and shorts. So the point that I wanted to make is that this method of floor and ceiling exists whether you're looking at relative versus absolute, whatever time frame, whether you're looking at five minutes, whether you're looking at one minute, whether you're looking at 30 minutes, whether you're looking at daily, weekly, whatever, it works. It's a universal thing, like market goes up, makes a pause, okay, makes a low. So, uh, sorry to cut you out, Lauren, we have a couple of questions uh, on the basis of this chart that uh, one question from Tony is, what is a standard deviation of what? All right, standard deviation is, that's a good question. So standard deviation, in this case, it's uh, it can be based on returns, it can be based on price. So standard deviation is a measure uh, of uh, versus the, the average. So I use, uh, personally, I use 63 days. So it's a, it's a measure of volatility. The distance is expressed in units of volatility. Now, why is that? Why is that? Expressing it in percentage points doesn't really work. For example, volatile stocks like internet stocks that, or biotech stocks that jump up and down all the time, they are very volatile. So 10% in three days is just standard pr practice for them. On the other hand, bonds, they're the sleepy bonds, they don't have a lot of volatility. So standard deviation is a way to normalize returns by their volatility. So we express distance in units of volatility. It can be expressed in standard deviation, it can be expressed in average true range, but the whole idea there is to respect the volatility of the underlying instrument that we trade and to normalize it across asset class, whether it's bonds, whether it's stocks, whether it's ETS, whether it's Forex, everything gets normalized. The distance are normalized in units of volatility. And this is a very good question. I'm going to digress a little bit here, but thank you very much, Tony, for asking this question. What happened here, and since, uh, since March, is we had, um, uh, since uh, February, we had unprecedented volatility. 
like volatility spike through the roof. And uh, volatility usually reverses over three months. This is an interesting question, actually, because we were talking about this with a friend of mine who works on the Delta one a couple of days ago. And we basically looked at basically the gamma normalizers over three months. This is standard rotation for all. But the, the whole idea there is because vol everything was very volatile, normalizing the distances by volatility, when the standard deviation explodes to the upside or when volatility compresses as it does now, when it reverts back and compresses, it, it basically gives, it normalizes the distance. So you might see small moves, but in units of volatility it might look big, whereas you might see big moves, but in units of volatility it looks small, which is why the volatile rally that we had since March looked tremendous, but in units of volatility was actually fairly mild until recently. And finally, we're hitting the three months mark, so the volatility on the way down and on the way up have been digested. And now we're moving to a different start of market rotation. Did I so answer basically, the question? Uh, how, uh, how did you quantify red and green lows? It's another question. Ah! Sorry, I think in Japanese. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you're talking no, about the least. lines, or you're talking about the the, the charts, uh, the charts above these charts, these charts, like these uh, ones? No, no, the previous one, the current one that we're so showing, I believe. Ah, Oops. okay. So this one is a simple count. So I look at S&P 500. I look at uh, I counted the, the company, the number of stocks that were in bullish territory. So just a, uh, an absolute sum, like if if it's bull one, if it's bear minus one. And I just counted the number of minus one and the number of plus one. And doing it in relative, in relative returns, what it shows is that there's a fairly homogeneous number of, uh, fairly symmetrical number of bullish and bearish companies. Those that outperform, excess return, versus those that underperform. That's it. Can I answer the question? Um, okay, makes sense. Uh, another one goes out that, uh, it's from D that uh, I did not quite get how to split bears and bulls as shown on the chart. You will get there. We will get there. So, okay. so the idea there again. This is uh, topics. So this is topics since uh, I don't know ten years or no 2015. So what you see here is in absolute when it's a bull market, everything goes up. So the very important point, and this is something that uh, that. If there are two things you need to take away from this and the absolute versus relative, for people who do stocks, you want to do in relative mode. Because very importantly, that's how, oh dear, <laughs> absolute versus relative. Uh, so the idea uh, of absolute versus relative is when you're an absolute short seller, you're looking for the price to go down, right? So what happens? Is okay, so when we... same question, a same question from a user uh, who asked uh, how did you quantify the red and green lows is what is on the y-axis of the same chart? Is it a stock's price or index? Okay, so here is, uh, okay, so this is the index. So the green, the black is topics, as you can see. It's on the right-hand side. And this is a simple count. So 500. We have 500, so roughly 200 here, 200 there, and so on and so forth. So this is the price of the index, the underlying index, the topics in this case. And this is the number, the, the simple count, the simple number of companies are in bull territory and the simple number of companies are in bear territory. This is an absolute. Now this is in relative, as you can see, market goes up, market goes down, same number of companies are outperformed, same number of companies are, uh, same number of companies are outperformed, same number of companies are underperformed. What it means then, and this is very important, unfortunately I didn't have time to, to prepare this, or I didn't have time to find the chart, is what is, it, what is really important to understand is that when we look at things in relative terms, we're looking at not stocks that go up and stocks that go down, but we're looking at sectors. So to give you an example, a classic trade would be long tech, long high beta, long financials in uh, in bull market, long small caps, and then short utilities, because everybody knows, and food, short food, 
everybody knows that food is about to trail. Nobody wants to buy food when there when there's ton of money and people want to think that the next app is going to make it to the moon. Nobody wants to buy like a, a beverage drink. Like to be frank, if you were if you were managing money for a company, if you were managing a pension, and you say, well, I'm interested in your food company, and well, it's a bull, it's a bull market. What are you, what are you doing? Everybody would think you're crazy unless your name is Warren Buffett and you're buying Coca Cola. But that's a different story. <laughs> so, absolute versus relative. So we'll we'll talk about the swings. How we collect the swings later. But absolute versus relative. This is an important point. So, what we need to concentrate doing the relative is you will always have an ample supply of shorts and longs and the money is made on the delta so let's say for instance you buy amazon you short ge that's it the money is made on the delta the relative shorts are never crowded now one thing that we see here for instance those they're very when the market goes up there are very 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 few shorts in absolute i can guarantee that everybody's looking at the same shorts which means that those shorts become very very crowded which means that everybody comes to them, which means that the borrow is expensive, they're very volatile, everybody knows they're short, nobody's out there to buy them, which means that the volatility increases. But because there's so few of them, what happens is that people take big positions. Now, what happens when you take a big position on the short side with a volatile stock? You are very concentrated on the short side and diluted on the upside, on the long book, right? So what happens is, because you're very concentrated on the short side in volatile stocks, the volatility of the short book starts driving the volatility of the portfolio. Everybody follows so far? So if the volatility of the short book drives the volatility of the overall portfolio, what happens is you have an overall volatile performance. And clients, customers, they pay to have low volatility. So this is, there's obviously a natural difficulty. Whereas if you do it on the relative side, you never struggle. You short your food, you short your whatever, you buy your long tech, whatever, market starts to get a risk off. All right, let's go long utilities, let's short some NASDAQ. Here we go. And rotation, 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 rotation. Another thing about shorting absolute versus relative is when you short relative, every stock in the world is the same. Every stock in the world is the same. You have, let's say you're on the social media side, you have Facebook, Twitter, uh, what is that, uh, Byte Time, all these guys. So it's like one, when one stock underperforms, like example, Twitter, for instance, Twitter underperforms Facebook and the other ones, LinkedIn or whatever you name it, I, I don't really know, starts to underperform its peers. Then it underperforms the it's sub industry, then it underperforms the industry, then it underperforms the sector. Then Finally, it underperforms the market. And then finally, 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 it starts to go down in absolute. So for all the people who, should, who go out short selling in absolute out there, I won't give you my address because I know that it's gonna make you very angry and you're gonna wait for me downstairs trying to break my teeth, I don't like that. Uh, short selling in absolute is a laggard indicator and there's no worse insult for anybody on the market to be called a laggard indicator. So short relative, it's easier, and you will look super smart because you will be ahead of everybody. So moving on. And another thing that is important when doing, in, uh, everybody's still there? Questions, Vidant, questions at this point? Yes, one question from Asim is, uh, so for relative shorts, do you short the stock and long the index? Or do you uh, do it question. in dollar neutral terms? All right, good question. So, okay, uh, Asim, I knew you'd ask a smart question. It's interesting because you have it, uh, you have it, you have the index on the numerator. No, um, actually, no. The idea there, if you're running a long short equities, is basically you you measure, you restate everything in relative terms. So the price, the stop loss, the everything has to be relative. And this is where you need a portfolio management system that accommodates that. Like all the platforms like Reuters, Bloomberg, yada, yada, 
uh, trade station interactive they all give you the absolute price but then you have to restate it to divide it by the close on the index you have to do a little bit of work um, so shorting by the index or longing by the index to eliminate first of all it doesn't work now why does it doesn't work let's say you have s p 500 oh better let's take topics Topics has some, somewhere like 1,600 companies. Somewhere like 70% of the market capitalization of Topics is achieved in the Topics 30. As far as NASDAQ is concerned, I forgot NASDAQ, but it's like a huge amount is done by 10 companies. So if you want to go long some stocks and then short S&P or NASDAQ as an index, what happens is basically you are intrinsically net long beta. So for those who know, uh, for those who do not who do not know beta, beta is uh, what is that? Uh, covariance versus the index. Yeah, covariance. It's a covariance matrix versus the index. Basically, the index moves like one point. It's basically the slope. Yeah, it's the slope of the returns of the in instruments versus the the index. So let's say the, the index moves 1%, something that is small cap would move 2% or something like that, 1.5. And it works both sides. This is something that cuts both ways. So did I answer the question? I think so, yes. Yeah, okay. we can move. Yeah, he also agrees with me saying yes. Yeah, we can move ahead. Yeah. Okay, so now we, we know about like uh, the idea, the general idea of like floor and ceiling. And why is it, where, where does it work? It's because this is stable. If we look at moving averages, the worst thing that happens with moving averages is, is stable markets, like a sideways market. All the trend followers that use moving averages, the problem that they have is like, when it's trending up, great. When it's trending down, great. When it's trending sideways, they end up giving back a lot of their profit. Whereas with the floor and ceiling, there's only two regimes bull or bear and even when it's sideways it comes from a bull it comes from a bear so it doesn't really matter now the next thing the difficulty the most difficult thing for that is to find swings and now we're going to talk about the the rules for swings and this is where it gets interesting and again it took me about 10 years to simplify this and then we're going to talk about the code so the this i forgot okay so this one is the ETF of Japan, EWJ. So I've been long. I, I mean, I was short. I turned around and went long. And tonight I'm going to go short. So it's my home market. Um, so the idea there is how do we define swing? So to, to define, let's go back. It is all based on swing high, swing low, swing high, swing low. So we measure peaks versus significant swings that happen here and there. Market goes up, market goes down, and so on and so forth. So the difficulty is how do we define those swings? And this has been a quest for, for me for a long, long time. And finally, and uh, for those who bought the course, the original version was not good. So this is where we're going to go with the code. And we uh, come up with a lagless version of it. So the idea there, it, it has two things, a distance test and then a retest. Now, we're going to start with a distance test. The idea is, as you can see here, there's a low, there's a high, but it's fairly close to one another, especially in high volatility. The volat the, for swings to be recognized, they need to pass a distance test. It needs to be significantly apart from one another, measured, as Tony mentioned earlier on, in standard deviations or in average true range. Now the retest, what is the retest? So let's follow the, the chart here. Up, market goes down, market goes down, market goes down, market goes down. As you can see, low, high, low, high. So low, high, going down, thank you very much. Low, high, low, high, low, high. And then low, high, and then boom. It will continue to record the low. And from the later, from the lowest low, it has to be the lowest low, and it has to be the highest high. 
we go subsequently and we measure first high. So the market rebounds. It doesn't take, in this case, for instance, the market rebounded, but it took the previous low, not working. Goes down, goes up, but it takes this one. And in this case, it starts not to take out the lowest low. So the retest is here. Either we take the first high, either we take the latest one. So basically what happens is we take the minimum of the range each time, tuk -tuk -tuk -tuk, so that the range would actually narrow down over time. Because what happens every now and then, you have a big player who comes in, tilts the, gives some market impact, and this gets out of whack. It's especially relevant in uh, day trading, intraday. So in this case, what happens is, then the price goes up. So the lowest low is lower. So we don't take the lowest low. That's the condition number one. And then the close penetrates the minimum of either the first high or the latest high. So in this code, I'm sorry, the code is a complete mess, but, uh, oh, no. <laughs> So, all right. So this is uh, this is correlation done. This is here basically. It's either the first low or the lowest low. So it's index zero or index minus one. And then price crosses above. Sure enough, what we have is the market. What happens is now the bulls are in charge. And similarly, here we print a, lower, a highest high, market tanks, uh, but it fails to take the, the high. Trades water, goes nowhere, and it prints lows, and it prints lows. And instead of taking the highest high, it starts to crack down. So it's a retest high. This is called a retest high, and this is called a retest low. And those retests, they happen everywhere. If we look at it, for instance, it happens here. It happens there. This could be bearish. But because we impose a distance test, all this is noise. And because the distance test is done in units of volatility, in high volatility, those were actually too small to qualify. So what happens, and this is an interesting chart, what happens is actually all this time around the with high volatility, the distance test was not met. There was one case where it started to be met was here. And then there's something called uh, runaway. But all of it is taken care of, the, taken care of in the code. In the code, what we have here, this is pretty much an expression of that. We look at the latest one and this. So those retests, they happen quite frequently. In and of themselves, they don't have much statistical significance. But when we impose a distance says from here to there, what it says and what it says today, tonight, on a lot of stocks that we're going to see now. Let me pull out a one or two. Let me pull up this one. What it says, actually this one will happen a bit uh, earlier. But what it says here, this is what it looks like. This is the EWJ, as you can see, uh, 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 and poof, market gives signs of weakness. So the probability given the distance it rallied from 37, I think, all the way up to close to 58, that's a big rally. So now the bulls are tied. So those retest bull, those retest highs or those retest bears, they don't have much significance when they cluster together close to one swing. But when we hide, when the market has traveled quite a long distance, it just means that the market is tired. So we probably have a swing high. So this is a lagless version. So now that we have the swings, we can go to the regime. And the regime definition is, as we saw, is disarmingly simple. Let's go back, classic, breakout, done all right so the first part now we've gone through the mythology 
And now I would like to move on to what happened in February to through now. Any questions so far? Yes, a, bit, a question about your codes by Puneet is that how does how do you define T high and T low in when you re, re retest it in your codes? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I didn't catch yes. the question. Uh, uh, so Puneet asks, how does Lauren define T high and T low INT and he re retests it? Ah. These ones? Those ones? I think so, huh? yes. Okay. Puneet, so can the idea you, there. Puneet, can you confirm if that's the one you're asking about? Yes, he says yes. Okay, cool. So, all right. So, first of all, this is a long piece of code. When I sent it to Ishan Shah, he looked at it like, just give me a shorter version. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, sir, but anyhow. So, the way this works is different from the previous code. This one has two series, and they use something called find peaks. So find peaks, what we're looking for is something in topography. Topography is looking at mountains and looking at the ones that stand out. Uh, we look at prominence. So we have two series, one to identify the tiny blips that we see, like those babies, just they need, like this one needs to be surrounded by at least two clothes that are higher to print this one. That's it, that's as far as it goes. That's the first series, that's the retest series. The second series that we identify, this one needs to have a bit more prominence. Prominence is basically they need to stand out a little bit compared to the other ones. As in like five, five different periods. So that's the first thing, we do download those two series. I mean, no, we don't download, we process those two series. And then we do, in terms of structure of the code, then we do an alternation. We do an alternation loop whereby because we download those series separately we combine them together and we want to have highs lows highs lows then we want to have lows that are surrounded by higher by highs that are higher than the lows and vice versa so we clean the series and then we impose a distance test the distance test is basically as i said before Ooh, go back, go back, go back. Are they? And the distance test is to clean up all the swings that could happen here. So once we've done that, we end up with something. It will print this. It will print that. It will print this. It will print all of these. That's the way. Uh, that's the way. Uh, Find peaks works. It prints us. It prints an extreme, and then I have to go back in the third part, which is here in the code. I have to go back and take those away. I have to uh, then we join, we put them together in the same data frame and so on and so forth. Not very complicated. Then for the last one, we have to perform an adjustment. So the last adjustment goes with last swing high and last swing low. That's it. So we look at the latest one and then we look at literally the latest in terms of index, like what is the latest date? So if the latest date Prints of swing high. Remember that in terms of swings in the two series, the swings are the ones that happen uh, less frequently and they're printed by default. So our job is to remove or allow. By default, it's it's there. So if the swing high, if the latest swing is a swing high, then we have to perform, we have to find a retest low. It's either the first or the latest. So once we have identified this thing that will come naturally, from there, we look at either this one, low, or the latest, or this one, or the latest. And then, then we narrow, we look at the highest one. Because if we didn't go for the highest one, what would happen is if it, it would run away, run away, run away. So what happens here is the range narrows. So as I mentioned before, every now and then you have people who show up and boom, they break the back of the stock. 
So it goes back and goes back and goes back. And sometimes it takes it out like it does here, like it did here, like it did here, like it did here. And sometimes it doesn't. So we want to narrow, 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 because it would be a waste as well. Like, let's say the thing varies all the way there. And then finally, it tanks, you give up a lot of performance. Same story here. From there, you know that that thing is going up. You don't have to wait all this time. So this is what the code does. The code naturally narrows the range. And then, so if the close is still above the retest low, then we take it away. Same story, this is the runaway swings. Runaway swings is, in this case, for instance, oh, we realize that actually this thing happened but then the market turned around without actually printing a swing low. Okay, false positive. And those false positive happened. In this case, all these were dismissed. This one, I don't know, to be frank. I don't know. I didn't trade on that one. Uh, I don't think it did, actually. But it could very well have, for the sake of argument. In this case, what happens is, okay, my false positive market keeps on running away. So in the end, we want to have a clean series. And this is something that actually you can, by the, you can actually, uh, did I answer the question first, you think? I think so, yes, yeah. He confirms yes, you, you did answer the question. So that's it. So once we have the swings, once we have the regime, then we can turn into uh, to something uh, that actually works. And it gives us something like this. So let so I downloaded today. So let's go through this. And unfortunately, most unfortunately, I had a technical problem. So this is a, you'll have a cleaner version of the notebook. So this, these are all the, so first we import all the libraries. Then we import this, like all the world indices using, uh, that are available on Yahoo Finance, da 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 da. Then we download, we use this thing that Rana will see for free did on the GitHub. So you can go on his GitHub page and uh, there's a override or you can use anything. But in this case, it's just a download batch. So all those functions will be there. So we do a flat download. Then, uh, there we go. Okay, so let's do that again. Let's do that together. And I'll show you, and uh, you'll have a much cleaner version of the, of the, of the book, notebook. I'll make a cleaner version um, in, the, in the upcoming days. I insist on this. I want people to have a very clean tool that they can play with. Uh, and then we'll look at what the world looked like. So now that we've gone through this, what happened in the markets? So a lot of the markets have tanked, boom. A lot of the market have turned bearish, like they've penetrated the floor, they've penetrated this, and a lot of the markets have turned bearish. And as a short seller, this is not my first rodeo. What I would like to talk next about is a bear market rally. So what we've experienced since March is a bear market rally. And if you, assimilate the, the the concept of the floor and ceiling what you get to see is that you know what here the market tanked but it's inevitable that it would be a rally we print a high that thing tank that thing is not going to tank forever at some point it will turn around and start to go up at some point there will be a retest and that thing will go up at some point, we're going to see something like this. This is what is it? Uh, we don't need to see that one yet. At some point, we're going to see Japan like this. And yours truly went long somewhere. I, go that, okay. I missed this one. I think I went there somewhere around here, somewhere around that bar. I thought I had my uh, entry. So I went long that market because I knew that that thing tank and it's not going to tank forever. At some point, that thing's going to go up. So my strategy all along as a short seller was, you know what, that thing's going to go up. So I went long a lot of stuff. I went long lithium. I went long what, a bunch of ridiculous stuff that I had no clue 
uh, I went long Italy, I went long Indonesia, I went long uh, Spain, I stayed short because I was already super short. I went long, what is that? Uh, social network, social media. So that is a very good example, actually. Now I have a, still have a tiny position compared to what I, one tenth of the position that I had before, or one fifth. So what happened is we print a lot, da, 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 and you can see actually the retest in practice. So here we have the retest, tac, 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 tac. The price closes above, and here what we have this thing called sloppy execution. That is my specialty. <laughs> Sloppy execution. This is, this is what I do better than anybody else. Look at that. I mean, come on. I entered on the high of the day. Oh, Christ sake. Come on. Somebody needs to euthanize, euthanize me. <laughs> so, the idea there the anatomy of a bear market, and this is important for everybody who wants to sell short to understand this. It took me 10 years to figure that out. So, so one question you have is uh, can we predict the likely fall by this theory no 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 that's the thing that's the thing like it has no forecasting uh, ability it has no like the you see i mean interestingly enough a lot of people the sales market is going to like the fibonacci and all those kind of people the guy the fibonacci and all this thing First of all, once I met Jack Schwager and uh, I invited him to a conference here, and he told me about, uh, he met the son of uh, Mr. Gunn. And uh, so Jack was like, wow, amazing. Was he so rich? Well, I hated uh, the fact that I had to ruin your type the newsletter of my father. So all those predictive geometric, they look nice, they're fantastic. It's basically, if you think about it in terms of psychology, it's, it puts order in chaos. They want to predict, they want to soothe the mind of market participants. Unfortunately, the markets don't work like that. There's, and it's proven to death that there's far too much randomness. So there's no predictive power. On the other hand, it has statistical robustness. So when we talk about, for instance, like the floor and the ceiling, and the swing and so on and so forth, we have actually a cumulative probability distribution that gives you a probability that it might work. And then, this is something that I want to talk about in the end, we have a signal, it doesn't mean that we are going to have a profitable trade. We need to distinguish signals from order management. But let's, did I answer the question? I believe so, yes. Uh, another question from the same user is, uh, can a lot of short selling in 2004 indicate bubble burst as in 2008? I don't understand. I don't understand the question. Okay, I'll repeat once. That is, uh, can a lot of short selling in 2004 indicate bubble burst as in 2008? Ah, uh, the time frame is off, but the idea is there. Okay. So the, it alludes to bear market rally, and this is an important concept that I would like to talk about. Bear market rally, what, what, why do they happen? When do they happen? And why did the market rally so much? Well, there are a couple of things here. First of all, the market tanked. So out there, you have a bunch of institutionals who are forced sellers. Now, when institutions and everybody sells, and the market was frothy, yada, yada, I mean, you name it, it doesn't really matter why, actually, but what matters is that it happens. Like, doesn't matter really why you die. What I, what ends is that you end up in a coffin anyhow. <laughs> so uh, a lot of people were for sellers, and what happened is if you know if you go back, you'll see that the sentiment turned bearish, catastrophic, blah 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 blah. People like you give a thousand dollars to people, they buy video games and guns. Great. Like, don't you supposed to feed the family? But anyhow. So a friend of mine at Capital said like it was it was a gasp because people like this, the monthly sales of Smith and Wesson went up. Wow, it's terrible. So anyhow, the idea there is the sentiment. It doesn't really matter, but the sentiment went turned emit a very very angry bearish. Like it was the it was the it was the end of the earth. Next thing you know, like the the, the earth is about to split and people are going to be swallowed in. So 
what happens then in this case is the selling pressure is exhausted. Everybody, the put call ratio goes to an extreme. You can see the borrow utilization spike. That's always something that I love to look at. I look at the delta of borrow as a short seller. So to look at the short utilization, which to me is my primary indicator, short utilization. The second thing that I look at is like the delta of borrow over time. So basically, like a lot of people were shorting more. And uh, all, the fund, all the institutional players are out, like they were forced out, so they don't participate. So, and then the fundamental news is horrible. So what happens is like, because all the selling pressure is exhausted, any buying pressure tilts the stock up. So the very important thing to understand about bear market rally is that they go on much longer and much higher than most people expect. And this time around, I was caught on the back foot, but I'll explain that later. And I made a lot of mistakes. What happens is it go much longer and much higher than people expect because all the selling pressure is gone. So the way it works is what happens is the short sellers, like a lot of guys who are like, oh yeah, this is the end of the earth. Okay, let's show the shit out of it. And they start sitting on stocks. They push them down as far as they can. But then as buying pressure starts, there's basically like a tumbling domino. First shorts get covered, second round of shorts get covered, and so on and so forth. And then you get the retailers coming through. And the reason is they don't really care. They either they usually are in to punt, so and they usually punt on the long side. So they start to add to the volume, and because everybody's sold, nobody's out, everybody is already sold. So everybody's the only volume is tilted to the upside. It's always axed on the upside. And what is important then to understand is how bear market rallies end. And this is always the funny part. The way they end is basically people throw the towel, so the short sellers capitulate, capitulate, and then the borrow becomes available again. And the news and the sentiment change. And if you look at the news now, if you look at the news now, it's actually funny. Like, okay, we're out of the big crisis, we got recovery. You look at Bloomberg, the AI market recap of Bloomberg. You know, when they write the, the like, it's funny because if you look at market opening and market midday and market closing on Bloomberg, like the market recap, it's definitely AI powered uh, articles. So markets opens up, yeah, recovery of the market, blah, blah, blah. People see past the COVID, midday market well, it goes nowhere. Well, it's a bit mixed. Traders are a bit of waiting and patient, like the fundamentals, we're not really sure about that. Then the, in the closing the market tax, yeah, everybody's worried about the second wave. What we're talking about like the second wave for the next two years. So what we're talking about here is um in the end, by the end of a bear market rally, everybody is on board and it's powered by FOMO. The same institutions that sold early, they reluctantly are forced into the market. They force back into the market because they hate doing that. I know because I was one of them before. And I hate doing that and we're forced into it because we didn't participate. So we, we are out there for the last mile. And this is right around the time when the momentum starts to get exhausted and we have something like, what is that? Let me show you. Do you still see my screen? Yeah, something yes, like this. Can. Yeah, we can see it. We have something like this, basically. This was like da, 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 the market didn't go anywhere, da, 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 da. and then boom, the final pop, and you can see that okay, market is trading water and so on and so forth. So people say, yeah, retailers, retailers, it doesn't matter. They, oh, they're going to be on the wrong side. It doesn't matter. Some of them were retailers, some of them were in store, some of them were hedge funds. It doesn't really matter. So the idea there is, why did we have a bull market like this? What I mean, what are we in a bull market? Are we in a bear market? And why did it happen? Why was it so violent? Why did it stay so long? What, what we had now, we didn't have a bull market. We had a bear market rally. And in some cases, it morphed into a bull market. In some cases, it's just a bear market rally. So this rally was inevitable. If we look at this through the prism, through the framework of floor and ceiling and swings and bear market rally, this rally was inevitable. It was absolutely inevitable. It was. It just surprised everyone by its intensity, by its duration, and by its magnitude. And the disconnect, 
that we happen because of the economy, I think I'll leave the floor to this gentleman who will explain, Robin Williams, who will explain to us what happened. Now, after that, I'd like to talk about one last thing at the fundamentals and then we'll open to questions. So what happened here is uh, the market was about to tank and then right around that time, this is when the Fed and everybody, they decided to use a nuclear weapon on the market. But it didn't matter what everybody does. is like, you know, when you throw so much liquidity, the market will rally. And if you listen to that clip with Robin Williams, you'll understand exactly. And this thing hasn't aged one bit. So before that, there was a question about fundamentals. So fundamental, technical, yada yada. I started as an accountant. I started as a fundamental short seller. And the difficulty with that is your sift is not scalable because you have to sift through a lot of financial statements. And if I can tell you one thing is that companies are usually not extrovert when it comes to disclosing bad news. Nobody wants to run around saying, oh man, I just fucked up Royal. <laughs> Everybody wants their stock options and everybody wants to do their share buybacks. So this is not scalable. And you're focusing on the balance sheet when everybody's focusing on the earnings. So there's a time discrepancy there. So doing fundamentals, only fundamentals and going through the balance sheet and the valuations and so on and so forth does not work. It's not a good starting point. It doesn't mean it should not be done. It means it's a bad starting point. So what you want to do first is segregate the regime into bull stocks, bear stocks. The stocks are in bear regime and uh, relative. These guys, okay, you want to look at them as potential bear candidates. And then you want to find out why, if you need to. And then on the bull side, the stocks are in bull regime. These are the ones that you want to put on long side and you want to find out why, if you want to. So that sifts off, that basically separates it basically is a form of triage and that is a very efficient way to go about it. So I hope I answered the question about fundamental short selling. Now in terms of last part, and this is something we briefly talked about before, we have a signal that works. Does it mean that it's profitable? No. It means it's profitable over time. Not all the time, but over time. So the last thing that I'd like to talk about is how to sell short, how to translate signals into order management. Now, you might have stocks that are in bull regime, bear regime, but it doesn't mean that, like to give you a very good example here, and you'll understand better here. In this case, we have a bearish signal. That thing might tank, but if it goes all the way, if it pops around here, then we'll have a bullish regime again. And we, it's very likely that from overall, all the markets that we see, like, uh, let's, let's, let's look at a few, let's look at a few. This, you'll, you'll receive the, this notebook, you'll receive a cleaner version of this notebook. And along with this notebook, you'll receive this. You'll receive like a screening that will tell you this is what I do on ETF and you'll have the same thing with uh, stocks and so on and so forth. This is the kind of screening where it tells you, okay, these are the, this is where we have a regime, we have swings and so on and so forth. So anyhow, so the point that I wanted to make here is, okay, for the time being, this thing looks bearish. So how do you want to articulate this? You want to enter, place a stop loss around here, it goes down a little bit, take some risk off the table, and if it rebounds around here, then it's fine. Switch side, go long. Now what we have here is we dissociated signal from order management. Order management is basically articulating the gain expectancy around the signal. Now, what is gain expectancy? Gain expectancy is the number of times you win, times how much you win, minus the number of times you lose, times how much you lose. And how does it look like? And then after that, we'll open the floor to questions. 
mean reversion, what we do here is basically, oh, regime has changed, it goes down a little bit. Let's, once it does twice that distance, let's take some money off the table. Because one thing you want to avoid as a short seller is a short squeeze. So you want to take risk off the table as early as possible. Once you've done that, you've accomplished this in a distribution where you have a very high win rate. Another way to look at it is what I did here. I went long with my sloppy execution. I closed part of the trade. I think it was somewhere around here. Yeah, somewhere around here, I think. And then that thing just happened to run. <laughs> Sorry, it just happened to continue. So what we're doing here is we're trying to capture high win rate, small profits. And then what happens here, the remainder that was bought around here goes on forever. Like one fifth of that, like yeah, it was 3,500 shares. Now it's only 700, one fifth of the position, but that thing keeps on running. Does it make sense? So ideally, you want to have a PL distribution that looks like that. All right. Now let's open the floor to discussion. <sighs> Glass of water. Sure, Lauren. So, yes, I believe we have a few questions piled up. Uh, the one is um, so how do you identify per perfect floor and ceiling is it waiting for another one two weeks before we conclude I'm gonna start trading tonight <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah as soon as I get off the call I'll sleep a little bit and I'll start trading I mean, sorry about that but uh, okay uh, so um, is so Another question is, um, what is the reliability of the trade winning to losing trades for this model? And what is the risk reward ratio for this shorting model? Does it work in all markets? It works, okay, that's a very good question. It, uh, th this, this is a perfect illustration of what I was trying to talk about now. Yeah, so, I'm not going to share uh, my portfolio, but my win rate on the long side, since uh, since blah, 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 I only have two, I've only had three, uh, three bad shorts, uh, three bad longs. Wow. Uh, I, we can continue with the, the, there's a couple of things I wanted to. Uh, can, can, can I continue? I wanted to share something. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've had three bad longs since the beginning of the year and I have had 14, but uh, 12 bad shorts because again, like I got caught up. I mean, uh, when the, when the Fed decided to print and everything, uh, there's, I just caught caught up. So the win rate is actually substantially high, but the point is order management is how you articulate them. So I think a signal, the signal works somewhere like 55% of the time. No, 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 sorry, sorry, my apologies. The raw version of it works 58% of the time. The raw version, signal to signal. But now there are ways to juice it. In a bit, in a, and this is what I was trying to explain looking at this one. In this case, I went long slopey execution, closed a portion of it, and then went long thereafter, stayed long, reset the stop loss around here, and keep going. So, by doing so, it's a high probability trade, and then there's a tail. So, the objective is to catch the tail and catch the tail and keep a high win rate. I hope I answered the question. Have, uh, would you take a double trade example if you have 100 lots short and at stop loss to go long, will you take 100 into two sets so that it get into auto long? Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. I'm not sure I understand okay. the question. 
Okay, I'll rephrase it. Um, yes, please. Uh, would you take a double trade example? If you have 100 lots short and at stop loss, will you take 100 into two sets? Meant at a stop loss, would you take a reverse position of say yes. 100 lots? Two the answer sets, is yes. So that you can yes, enter yes. Auto into long. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Who, who asked this question? So the question was from Naresh. Uh, Naresh, I believe uh, I answered your question. Okay, so that's a fantastic question. Thank you very much. All right, let me, I mean, uh, this, okay. So I do uh, the strategy that I trade. And, uh, all right, that's a fantastic question you ask. Okay, let, 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 here, here we go. Uh, how are we going to do this? We're going to do it here. Yes, the answer is definitely most resoundingly yes. Okay, why is that? So, uh, this one, what happened here is I entered short somewhere around here. And unfortunately, yours truly got, uh, I impaired myself around there. Now, what happened in the strategy that I trade, I put a because what it what happens here is that it invalidates the short. So I put a, a long with a stop loss uh, at the, around here in this case for various reasons, but no need to take uh, to get into details here. Just conceptually, I want you to understand the concept. It's a very interesting question you ask. Um, then I went long, and I took. A portion of the of the position out when it hit the target price, and then that thing tagged. I reset it at stop loss. So again, it was super. I mean, it was my main specialty. I can t I can exactly show you on the chart. You see that thing here over there? That's your Strudy. I mean, it's not me per se, but that sloppy execution. That's me. <laughs> so anyhow, I went long, took some money off the table, and then I got stopped out again. And uh, the idea behind this is, I thought it was a short, market proved me wrong, I don't have any form of opinion about it, I'm gonna go long. And I closed out, and what happened is I, I mitigated my losses. So that is a fantastic question you're asking. So, and let me give you other examples of this. Um, when this thing decides to unfreeze, I'll definitely show you. Okay, now I decided. Oh, this one. What is it? I think it's either the Chinese consumer or the Chinese tech. So yours truly was long. And uh, I was forced out. I was very unpleased with this one. Uh, yeah, I was forced out. Literally, I was forced out there. And of course, it decided to rally. It was not pretty. Uh, again, same story. Yeah, this is when Mr. Powell decided that it was a good thing to uh, to move up. Market moved up. I went long, and I got stopped out again. So synthetically, I'm no longer long this one. Yes, I can show you precisely. This was my stop loss over there. It closed over up. I entered. I went long. I got four start. So I hope I answered the question. That was a very, very good question. Thank you very much. I think yeah. One one question we have uh, from uh, Vishwanath is uh, can we prepare a setup including um, MACD, STOC, RSI, Bollinger, Head and Shoulder, etc., and take a trade? Will these things are also covered in the training? No. No, they're not. Uh, all right. Okay. So, I mean, this floor and ceiling is about as simple as it possibly gets. It's mm -hmm. sophisticated. It's the same as gain expectancy. It's sophisticated. Now, MACD, RSI, ST, uh, forgot the other ones. You can use them uh, if you so wish. If you decide to use them thereafter, then you should if you want to. I would encourage you to back test them though. And I will encourage you to forward test them, but they're not included to answer your no question. Worries. No worries. No worries, not You know, we'll connect connect with you uh, personally and get in touch. Okay, so one last question. It's kind of um, 
a nice one it's apart from financial markets and i would really like to close in that trend because we have been involved in financial markets for past two hours so let's get off on a lighter note so the question for you lauren is what's the name of a digital cork board app being used ah yes this one right it's yeah exactly Corculus. okay i'll put it oh yes 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 Corculus. Corculus. let me put it in there hold on please uh, answers there are still 58 people i'm impressed uh, the question the answer is corculus.com okay guys so i think uh that's about it and uh we have uh confirmed and placed all your questions and any other thing we would be getting in touch with you personally so uh do not worry about it and we'll take care of everything thank you so much lauren really appreciate your time and um, you know being 11 pm we, we we thank you so much again and uh, we'll be in touch with all the attendees for uh, any questions you have and we will cater to them thank you so much for your time attendees really appreciate and we have a rest way right day ahead bye-bye thank you very much good night good night, good night.